Now, my relation to Jesus Christ is one of those few matters of life or death. To the average one of us who listen now, it's taken for granted that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I take that for granted. I assume that. I, I know that's true. I don't in any wise question it. And then it is further taken for granted and properly that we are saved by Christ alone without works. That I also take for granted because it's declared there. I don't question it. I don't ask that somebody come and, and explain it. It's so. He did die for our sins according to the scriptures. He did rise again. The scripture does say that we are saved by Christ alone without works. But now the big question is, and right here is a hole in the bridge where millions fall through. How do I come into saving relation to Christ? He alone saves without human merit or works. But he doesn't save everybody. Therefore, there must be some connection made or some relation sustained. Somehow or other, I come into a relationship to Christ that saves me. Now, what is that? And that is a matter of life or death. You dare not assume anything. You must know. Not to be sure isn't to gamble with your soul. Not to be sure is to be dead. Just as you dare not cross the mighty ocean without a compass, to do so would be to die. So you dare not assume that you have the relationship unless you have it's got to be there before you dare accept it as being there. To be wrong on this is to be lost. Now, if you were to ask the average man, the average preacher, or the average person who works the average Christian anywhere, how do I come into saving relation to Jesus Christ? The answer would be one of three. People would either tell you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's Acts 16.31. Or they would say, receive Christ as your Savior. That's John 1.12. Or else they would give you this other answer. And of course, those first two answers are true. They're true. And they, or else they would give you this third answer. Accept Christ as your personal Savior. Now, the word accept Christ, to the astonishment of a good many people, does not occur in the Bible. It's not there. It's this accept Christ doctrine that I want to talk a little bit about tonight. What is it to accept Christ? Now, I do not reflect on the words accept Christ, even though they're not in the Bible. It's possible to teach truth and yet not use words that are in the Bible always, because if what you say is the sum of what the Bible teaches on a subject, and you're teaching truth, provided the people know that that's the sum of the Bible teaching. So when you were told to accept Christ, to bring us into saving relation to him, what the, the teacher is attempting to do is to say, believe and receive. And believe and receive are Bible words, though accept is not a Bible word. But accepting Christ has become the panacea all over the evangelical world, and it has become fatal to millions. A whole attitude of accepting the passive acceptance of Christ, this easy acceptance. A man will preach a tremendous sermon and then say, now what should you do? Accept Christ. Have you accepted Christ? Or we go to the bedside of a dying man. Have you accepted Christ? And if he says he has, why well, we pat his head and the next day or two we preach that he's in heaven twanging a heart. Well, now I'm awfully afraid that there are millions of people who are perishing because they are being told to accept Christ and they don't know what's meant by it. You see, to tell a man to accept Christ, while it is relatively right, it yet, if not carefully explained, makes Christ to stand hat in hand waiting on my pleasure, meekly awaiting my verdict on him. It makes him apply to me instead of my applying to him. 
It permits me to accept Christ by an impulse of my mind or my emotions and accept him painlessly and at no cost and no inconvenience. Somebody suggested that the cross of Christ should not inconvenience people. Well, it's the most inconvenient thing in the world, this cross of Christ. It took a man by the name of Jesus in the height of his healthy human life and took him out on a hillside and killed him there. And that's an inconvenient thing for him. And you, any cross is inconvenient. And it's, it's a most inconvenient thing, this accepting Christ, if we know what we mean by it. But the accepting Christ of popular theology has no inconvenience attached to it. Now let's look at how it might have worked back in Old Testament times. Suppose that Moses had told Israel that awful, wonderful night, now stay in your houses and kill the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost and stay right there and accept the fact that it's done, the great transaction's done. You are delivered by the Passover blood. Thank God and rejoice and establish a tabernacle and stay right where you are. And they would have stayed right there in Egypt. The blood on the door, God waiting to take them out, but they stayed right where they were. They would have died in Egypt. They had to get up and get out of Egypt to prove they believed in the power of the Passover blood. That prodigal son, look at him. A certain man had two sons, and one of them said unto his father, Give me the goods that followeth to me. And he divided unto them, the two of them, the boys, his living. And uh, after a few days, the boy left the younger and went into a far country, and there he spent his substance with riotous living. And when he became hungry and had nothing to eat, he went and attached himself to a swine herd, and he fed swine. And he was there in the swine pen, and he got hungry because his wages wouldn't buy enough to eat. And it was a humbling thing for a Jew to uh, feed swine. And uh, one day uh, a man appears, and here I depart from the scriptures. One day a young man appears, and uh, this young man says to this boy who had gone away from home and was feeding the swine, he had a bundle of tracts, this young fellow, he was just out to buy the school, and uh, he had been taught how to win souls in nine easy lessons. And he goes up to this prodigal son lying in the, among the swine, and he says, I have good news for you. And he looks up and says, thank God I need it. I, I'm in need of good news. What is it? Your father is ready to forgive you. Well, the boy says, thank the Lord. Your father is ready to forgive you. Do you believe it? And the boy says, yes, I believe it. All right, thank God. Now, let's bow our heads and you thank the Lord you're saved. You believe the father forgives you. Yes, well, amen. Now, we'll thank the dear Lord that you're saved. And now, goodbye, don't forget to witness. And sometime I'll be around again. So the swineherd stayed right there in the far country. And he gets zealous and missionary. And he goes out and uh, he starts to make converts among the other swine herds. And pretty soon he has them all believing that the Father forgives. And they all do. And say, I thank God the Father forgives. All right. And then they build a little tabernacle and call it the first tabernacle of the swine, converted swine herds. And they all stay right there in the far country. Nobody goes home. And that boy is still ragged and dirty and smelly. And the people, the respectable people of the neighborhood, when they pass by, elevate their nose and hurry by. And they say, so persecuted they the prophets which were before us. It is the result of our holy living that they are giving us the cold shoulder. Then one day, while they're singing choruses in this first church of the converted swine herds in the far country, a young fellow comes along and asks permission to speak. And he rises and says to them, Put away your sins, ye wicked. Put away your sins. Learn to do evil. Learn to do good. Cease to do evil. And be righteous and follow the Lord. And do good and you'll be saved. And they pick him up and throw him out and say he's a legalist and that he doesn't believe in grace. Why, we're saved by accepting the doctrine. But this young fellow 
wanders off, and the time goes on, and the fatted calf gets old and dies, and the father passes away, and the boy stays on in the far country. Now, that's evangelism as it is preached a good deal today in America. It is believe on Christ, accept Christ, and stay where you are. Now, that is excused and explained by a hundred different learned ways. But it leaves the sinner in his sins. And the man in his sins will be damned as certainly as the sun rises in the east and goes down in the west. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ at one time passed by and he said, If any man will come after me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Those beautiful words of Jesus. If any man will come after me. Notice that he is interested and he is inviting. He is even urging, but he's not begging. We have reversed things in these last days so that Jesus stands on trial and we sinners stand in the place of the judge. And if we should choose to quit our sins and follow him, we think we've done him a service. And in the meantime, he stands pensively waiting. My friends, I want you to note that he passes by, and if any man will come, he shall live eternally, and he shall gain eternally. But if any man will not, he shall lose eternally, but Jesus Christ will lose nothing. Remember that if a sinner comes to Jesus, Jesus gains nothing. And if he refuses to come, Jesus loses nothing. For Jesus Christ is God, and God is self-contained and self-sufficient, and he holdeth the world in his hand. And if I come to him, I do not enrich him. If I stay away from him, I do not impoverish him. It is the whole thing, my brethren and sisters, is for me. I am the gainer and the loser. He is neither gainer nor loser. If he, if I come, he does not gain, for the stars in their courses are his, and the seraphim and the cherubim and the, the principalities and powers and mights and dominions and archangels and heaven itself and the sea of glass, all are his so that he cannot gain anything by my coming, and he will not lose anything by my not coming. Remember that. But if I come, he says, let him deny himself. Now, this is just what we dare tell people these days. This is just what the evangelists of another day told people, but this is just what we're afraid to tell them now. Let him deny himself. And in the dim light of modern religious notions, it's an odd thing that Christ should place such an obstacle before people, and that he should lay down a condition for following him, a condition that's exactly contrary to human nature. Nobody wants to deny himself. We want to preserve ourselves. And self-preservation is the first law of nature, according to everything that I've heard. And yet he lays down a condition for following him, that runs exactly contrary to human nature, runs counter to everything that's taught us in the school, contradicts the instincts of self-preservation, arrays all the power of our natural self against Jesus Christ, cuts down on the number of those that will come. Our Lord plainly often turned and cut down on the number of those that would come. And in doing it, he stepped up the quality of those who would come. But we, we step up the quantity and we don't care too much about the quality. If we can just get them to come, if we can just get them forward and say 2,912 or 506 or whatever it is came. Well, our Lord cared little about how many came. But he said, if anybody will come, let him come. He's welcome to come. I came to die for him and I'm rising to, to plead for him. And if he will come, let him come. But in coming, let him deny himself. Let him do exactly contrary to that which is uh, said by the, the world to be the natural thing to do. Now, I wonder if this Christ who laid down this obstacle, who put this huge hurdle in front of the kingdom of God, I wonder if that's the same Jesus, that the same Christ that now we, we have got to excuse him and edit him and amend him. We have to coach and beg and plead, plead to gain followers for him. Is this the same Jesus that gives everything and asks nothing? 
Is this the same Jesus that smiles and goes along with covetous businessmen and crooked politicians and carnal entertainers and half-saved cowboys? Is this the same Jesus? I don't think so at all. Paul talked about another Jesus, and I think there's another Jesus loose among us. And he's not the, father, the Jesus of the New Testament, nor the Christ of God. For the Christ of God is not begging businessmen. Neither is he camping at the dirty door of some half-converted uh, uh, sex dancer and begging her to come and putting up with anything and making any kind of an excuse for if she'll only come. He simply says, come if you want to. Come if you will. Anybody that will, let him come. Come unto me. But he doesn't beg and he doesn't coax and he doesn't, he doesn't compromise and he, he doesn't in any wise change his terms. He makes the terms and you accept them. Great many people come to the altar and howl and we say, well, he, he really, he's, he's under conviction. He's having a wonderful time there. What he's doing is trying to get the Lord to meet his terms. Well, the Lord will never meet your terms, mister. He will die and go to hell before he'll ever meet your terms. He lays his terms down and you meet them. He is God and you're a sinner. And you meet his terms. Young people meet his terms. Kids meet his terms. We all meet his terms. And whether it be presidents or kings or queens, they all meet his terms. And they must. He... he he positively never compromises. Let him come unto me, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross and follow me. Now that is to accept Christ. Now what is to accept Christ? Well, let me define it for you a little more closely. Acceptance of Christ is to form an attachment to the person of Christ, to the person of Jesus Christ. It's not to fall in love with the tender-faced Jesus. It is to realize that this tender-faced Jesus is also Lord and God that God has made him Lord over all things and head of the church, and that he has the keys of death and hell, and that he will sit upon the throne judging all mankind, and that God has given all power into his hand. This mighty Lord Jesus is to form an attachment to him that is revolutionary, reversing and transforming the light. If your Christian conversion did not reverse the direction of your life, if it did not transform it, then you're not converted at all. You are simply a victim of the accept Jesus heresy. And then, uh, what is it to accept Jesus? It is to form an attachment to the person of Christ that is not only revolutionary, but it is complete. That is, you can't compartmentalize your life. A lot of us try to compartmentalize our life. And we say, Jesus, you can have the front room and uh, the living room, and the den, and the upstairs bedroom, but the bedroom to the back, and the bedroom to the front, and the den, you can't have. You can't go to the basement. You only can stay in certain parts of my life. Well, now, that kind of horrible base dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ cannot but cause us to be lost at last. For me to accept Christ means that I am to accept him in every part of my being, and that I am to form an attachment to him, an emotional, an intellectual, a volitional attachment, which is complete, leaving no part of the life unaffected. If he cannot save, uh, cannot control you, he cannot save you. And if he cannot control all of you, he cannot control any of you. And then it's to be an attachment that is exclusive. I mean that Christ is not to be one of several interests. They tell us that in some countries, I shall not name them for these tapes get around. I understand they're going to Japan, and I'm not going to mention names of countries. But I am going to tell you this, that uh, there are some places where they will accept Christ and enthrone him, just as you enthrone a statue somewhere in your home, but they make him one more of several vital interests. He is one more of several. There is a church on Riverside Drive uh, in New York City across from that other tomb, Grant's tomb. And uh, they have a tympanum, a sort of an affair up above it, you know, an arch around. And they have, uh, they have uh, concrete, or maybe it's cut stone, more likely cut stone, seeing the money that was put into it heads of various great men. 
And they have Moses there, I think, and they have Socrates there, and they have Isaac Newton there, and they have Jesus there. And uh, they have, I suppose, Washington there and a few more. Jesus is there. He is one of several interests. Mark you, my brethren, a Christian is one who specializes. He's an exclusivist. He believes in Jesus Christ exclusively. He believes in him as Lord exclusively. And that excludes all other possible interests, possible saviors. It excludes all other possible hopes. The Christian who truly is born anew and has accepted Christ rightly has accepted him exclusively so that he is to the, the you what the earth, sun is to the earth. He is that which you revolve around. He is the central sun, and you are in orbit, moving round him, held by the bonds of his love, and lightened by the light of his face. And while you do have other interests, they are minor, and they're secondary, and they take their place down the scale. Christ is first. The Lord Jesus Christ is first. And for him, I, I surrender everything. To him, I give all. To Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, he can command me. He's ahead of my wife. He's ahead of my children. He's ahead of my ambitions. He is first and everything else is last. Anything else is not New Testament Christianity, brother and sister. Anything else is a compromise. And it leaves people half saved, confused, frustrated, bewildered, and in the dark. Jesus Christ is your exclusive Savior. And all other relationships are determined and conditioned by this one overwhelming, almighty relationship. Don't we see this in the stories our missionaries tell us? Don't we read it in Fox's Book of Martyrs? Don't we see it in the story of men and women down the centuries who have taken Jesus Christ and had to walk out on their families to take him? who have taken Jesus Christ and had to give up their jobs to take him, who have taken Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and have had to do things that shorten their lives in order to take him, if you don't, are not sufficiently, rather, if you're not sufficiently given to Jesus Christ and uh, exclusively attached to him, that uh, you would be willing to put your life on the block for him, I cannot see how you can claim to be a Christian. And denies me, I'll deny him before my Father which art in heaven. And let him take up his cross and follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be. And my Father will love him, said Jesus. Well, now to accept Christ then is to accept his friends as your friends. And when I come to that part, I get happy about it because the friends of Jesus Christ are the loveliest people in all the wide world. I am not ashamed of the friends of my Savior. Now, I know that there are some Christians who are a little tiny wee bit cracked on top. I know that. I know they're oddball, some of them. And I know they do odd things. I know some of them put badges on, you know, as, as big as a milk uh, cup, Jesus only, on their, on their lapels and go down the street, and they do odd things. But dear, bless them, they mean all right. And sometimes they'll win people to the Lord when some of us dignified people can't win them. You've heard of that fellow. He, he was a great preacher and a liar friend of his. Uh, oh, he tried to get him to church often, but he wouldn't come. And one day, one time he did come. Now, there was in that same church a man who hadn't too much in up here, but he had an awful lot down here. And uh, when he saw this lawyer, this great lawyer, saw him come in, this preacher would worry to death because this poor fellow with a whole lot in his heart and not too much in his head, he was in the habit of going around and asking people if they were saved. So uh, he just prayed silently that the Lord would help him to preach a great sermon and he would keep that fellow away from that lawyer because he knew the lawyer was a cultured, dignified gentleman who would probably walk out in us if anybody approached him. So when he gave the invitation after the sermon, 
This, this, sure enough, to his horror and dismay, this poor half-witted fellow went around to the lawyer, took a hold of his lapel, and the lawyer went out. Well, he said, I knew it would happen. So about midnight that night, uh, the phone rang, and the uh, lawyer was on the other end of the phone, and he said, Reverend, come over here. I want to see you. Oh, he said, I want to apologize to you. He said, I feel so bad about that. He said, about what? He said, about that poor fellow that went and bothered you there in the service. No, he said, come over, please. He said, I want to see you. So he went over. And he said, I am in distress. He said, my soul is ready to perish. He said, I've got to be saved. Tell me how to be saved. It didn't take very long for the preacher to lead the lawyer to Jesus Christ. So when they, he had come into the light of the new birth and was forgiven and regenerated, the preacher ventured to ask him, now just what was it in my sermon tonight that led you to the Lord? Oh, he said, Reverend, nothing in your sermon. He said, do you remember that odd fellow that came around and buttonholed me? He said, yes, I want to apologize. Don't apologize. He said, that's why I got saved. He said, you know what he said to me? He said, do you want to go to heaven? And I said, no. He said, well, go to hell then. And walked away. And uh, he said... He said, uh, I was mad, and I walked out of the church. But he said, as I went down the street, it came to me, heaven or hell, heaven or hell, heaven or hell. And he said, if it isn't heaven, it's hell. And he said, that's why I sent for it. So I tell you, brethren, I love God's people. And I take, I accept his friends as my friends. And I don't care what color they are. If they're holy people and his friends, they're my friends. And I'm not ashamed of them. And I'm not ashamed of my camp meeting friends. I preach in colleges and seminaries and among the big shots, and I preach to bishops and all the rest. But I love God's simple, plain people, people without much education, and maybe they don't have all the culture, and they think Beethoven played right guard for Yale and all that kind of thing. But uh, they, they are God's sheep, and if they're God's sheep, they're mine, and if they're the Lord's children, they're my brethren. Accept his friends as my friends. Then to believe on Jesus Christ savingly is to accept his enemies as my enemies. Now that's where that's another thing. The enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ will never get an apology from me, brother. I have prayed, oh Lord, don't let anybody love me that doesn't love thee. Don't let me be popular at your expense. Don't let churches that wouldn't have you invite me. Don't let people come to me that wouldn't come to thee. I want thine enemies to be my enemies, and thy friends to be my friends. I love the friends, and I am not afraid of the enemies. What was it, Phil, that Doddridge wrote? Hast thou a lamb? Hast thou a, hast thou a foe before whose face I fear thy cause to plead? Hast thou a lamb in all thy flock I would disdain to feed? And the answer is no. Not an enemy before whose face I wouldn't plead the cause of Christ. Not a lamb that I wouldn't feed, no matter how poor he might be. So I accept Christ's enemies as my enemies. And I accept his ways as my ways. I take his ways. I don't come to him and get a badge or a ticket telling me that I'm saved and then go my way. I come to him and then I go his way. Follow me, he said. That means you go his way. The way of obedience, the way of prayer, the way of service, the way of, of consecration, the way of love, the way of mercy, the way of holiness, that's his way. And then I accept his rejection as my rejection. That is to accept Christ. If they reject him, they reject me. I've already covered that, I think, in that on the enemy, so I'll skip it and point out that I accept his cross as my cross, or at least I accept the a cross as my cross. Jesus Christ says, take up your cross. What is the cross of Christ? Well, somebody gets a toothache and says, I'll bear my cross. No, you won't, brother. That's just a toothache. The devil might get a toothache if he had teeth. And I don't know what he does. He has a tail, I suppose, but I don't have teeth. But uh, those things that come to you, your baby dies, or your... your uh, cow gets sick, or your corn crop uh, doesn't work, it doesn't come up, and or uh, the drought hits your field, you say, that's my cross. No. A cross is something you take up voluntarily, and you didn't take up that voluntarily. That was just, that's just one of those things that happens to the good and the bad light. If it gets to be 104 degrees as it did here last, this week, 
That isn't a cross. Every sinner down the highway was rubbing his forehead along with you. So that is no cross. You're not going to get a reward for rubbing and wiping perspiration in a hundred and four temperature. That's no cross. That's simply, uh, it happened that way. Every robin was drooping his wings here. So a cross is something you take up deliberately. It is obedience to Christ. It is doing what the Lord commands you to do and then taking the consequences. And if the consequences mean a cross, then take the cross. Jesus Christ didn't choose the cross. That is, he didn't choose it in the sense that he wanted to die on a cross. But he wanted to save you and he wanted to obey God and the cross was the only way out. So he went to the cross because he was obedient to his father and because he loved you. And so a cross is obedience to God and love for mankind. And when whatever results that's painful and harsh and hard and bitter, even death itself, that's the cross. So I take the cross as he took his cross. And then I accept his life as my life. Oh, thank God for that. You don't stay on a cross forever. He took six hours to die, but he's alive how long? Forevermore. He came back from the dead. And that was, that was to the consternation of the devil and to the confusion of the Pharisees and to the distress of the Roman Empire. He was dead, but he liveth again. And a Christian that's truly a Christian will die with him, but will come back from the dead also. I mean die in this, right now, in this, in this life. Die to your ambitions and die to your pride and, and die to all of those things that the world glories in. You die to them. The world glories and you die to them. Brother Brown said the other night, no man has a right to claim anything till he dies to it. And he's perfectly right. I agree with him a hundred percent. And then it's to accept his future as your future. Oh, wonder of wonders. He came back from the dead. He went to the right hand of the Father. One of these days he'll be crowned with all the crowns there are. The crown that God will put on his head and then the crown that his own people will put on his head. They'll come from the north and the south and the east and the west and they'll cast their crowns before him. He is Lord of Lord and King of Kings and they'll cry, O Christ of God, take unto thee thy power and reign. And you and I are a part of that if we're followers of Christ. We can afford to put up with a little inconvenience now because all the glory lies ahead. Let me say to you that that man who tries to take the inconvenience out of your life and smooth over the cross and paint it up and make it acceptable socially, that man is your enemy. I don't care if he's a reverend or a DD, he's your enemy. That teacher, whoever he is, that tells you that Christianity is a whooping good time and great fun, he's lying in your teeth, and you ought not to accept it. Christianity has its glory, unspeakable and joy unspeakable and full of glory, but it also has its cross. And Jesus Christ bore the cross for the joy that was set before him. But were we carnal children, we lamblings, we saintless, we little pocket editions of, uh, of, of a Christian, we don't want to bear any cross or have any inconvenience. We don't want to be kept home from the lake. I don't know what you do here, but my dear friends up in Canada, I've said nice things about them, and I'll say this about them now. If this gets up into Vancouver somewhere, amen. It's all right. I love Canadians, but I don't excuse the fact that when summertime comes, they leave and go to the lake and desert the churches. I don't know whether you do it here. But any Christian listening to me that habitually takes his family away from the church of God over the weekend is no true Christian at all. He is a make-believe and he is a hypocrite and I don't care if he's on your board and chairman of your board of elders and a deacon, he's still not serving God nor carrying a cross. Now, a vacation is one thing and I suppose everybody ought to have a vacation. Sometimes I wonder what they take a vacation from. They'll loaf all the time anyhow and then take a vacation from it. But uh, you probably need some help. Some of you men love to go out and play golf or something. Do it. It's all right. But as soon as golf becomes your lord and boss and you talk about it all the time instead of talking about the lord and your foreign missions, it's got you, brother. You're a, a golfaholic anonymous. <laughs> never heard of that before and I hope I never hear of it again.
But if your, if your boat with a putt-putt on the back takes you away from the house of God on Sunday, it's a putt-putt on your way to, 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 to loss and chagrin in the day of Christ. No, no. He calls you to take his hard way, that he may lay his crown gently upon your brow in the day of his triumph. Now, that's what it means to receive Christ, to accept Christ, to believe on Christ. And it means all that, and it doesn't mean any less. And any fiddling around or any effort anybody makes to pat your back and smooth you down and get you in, it's just too bad. What Robinson told about the seeing a, a, a nest of chickens. And he said he saw them pick their way out of the shell, and oh, what a terrible time they had. They struggled and fell over and tumbled around. He said he pitied them from the bottom of his heart. He said, the next hen nest that I see hatching, the next eggs that I see hatching, I'm going to help them out. So he said the next time he saw a hen hatching, he pushed her off and picked them all out of the shell and said they all died. And uh, that is what's matter with so great, so many of our Christians. We have picked them out of the shell. In order to get them at all, we have rushed ahead and picked them out of the shell. The result is they die all around us, and we say they backslid. They never backslid because they never were regenerated to start with. To accept him is to accept him with a, a revolutionary acceptance. It's to accept, accept him completely, all of him to all of me. It's to accept him exclusively and not any other hope but him. He alone is my hope. It's to accept his friends as my friends, his enemies as my enemies, his ways as my ways, his rejection as my rejection, the cross as my cross, his life as my life, and his glorious future as my glorious future. That's what it means to be a Christian. And my dear friends, it's worth everything. And if we all had to believe on Christ tonight and die tomorrow, we'd spend one eternity thanking God with tender affection that he allowed it to happen. Yes, sir. You can't afford to be lost. You can't afford to take for granted you're saved. When all's happened, somebody has picked you out of your shell and tried to make a Christian out of you, and you've never known what it is to be born again. Moral sanity requires that I settle the matter whether I am in right saving relation to Jesus Christ or not. I don't ask if you've signed a card. I don't ask if you've baptized, been baptized. You can do both of those and be lost. You can be saved and do both of them too, but they don't save you. But if moral sanity requires that I settle it. Will you settle it? Now, don't take it for granted. Remember, you're not gambling. You're guaranteeing that you'll be lost. To fail to come into right relation to Jesus Christ is to commit moral suicide. Young people particularly, in this terrible hour of putrefaction and corruption, in this frightful hour of shallowness and superficiality, when our youth are being led astray by people who ought to know better, and they're romping and kicking up their heels and playing their way into the kingdom and playing their way off to heaven, only to find they've played their way to hell. And you dear young people, I could love you till I'd lie down let you walk over the length of me from now till morning, if only I could save you from the false teaching that would make acceptance of Christ to be a lark. Acceptance of Christ is a revolutionary act that changes you from the ground up. But you say that's true only for older people. That's true for every person. I knew a boy with a Jewish mother and a Gentile father. I married them. Then that boy was born. He grew to be about 18. He was in great danger of becoming a juvenile delinquent. Well, I gave the altar call and even into the prayer room, the inquiry room where we used there in Chicago. His name was Dave. And everybody knew what kind of a scoundrel Dave was. He went into that room. I thought, well, there goes Dave. It probably won't much come of it. So God knows my faith didn't help much. Pretty soon Dave came bounding out. He came out like a, like a racehorse out of the whatever they are. 
And uh, he hunted me up. His face was aglow. He'd been converted. Well, I thought, very good. But he's an emotional boy, and we'll see how it works. Well, you know, it wasn't very long till he was one of the leaders in the church. It wasn't very long after that till he came to me with a shining face and said, I'm going to Bible school. Off to Bible school he went. And when he got there, he just shook that school. And he's been going right on ever since. That boy's named Dave Schaefer. My dear friends, he was only a kid, too, just a kid. Don't wait till there are gray in your temples. This message of acceptance, radical, revolutionary, exclusive, final acceptance of Christ with all that you have, that's for everybody. That's for the youngest person that can hear me tonight, as well as for the oldest person that hears me. Let's pray a moment. Now, dear Lord Jesus, we're with thee in this. We're with thee in this. We attach ourselves to thee now with deliberation. Thy word has been given, thy invitation, and explanation of what it means. Now, Lord, if they follow thee, well and good. If they do not, then I don't know what I can do. O Christ, this night we beseech thee. Thou wilt help every one of these listening to reconsider and rethink and decide whether heaven is more desirable than hell, whether the inconvenience of cross-carrying and the persecution and troubles that brings to follow the Lamb whether it's where these things are worth while in the light of eternity. We beseech thee, O Lord. We pray thou will save us from superficiality. Save us, we pray thee, from this pseudo-Christianity that's going about. Save us from fool's gold. Save us, we pray thee, from alkali water that kills us. Save us, we pray thee, O God, from all this watered-down stuff that leaves us where it finds us. Only that we think we're right when we're not. Have mercy upon us. Oh, God, have mercy upon us. Bless these dear friends. And before they go to their place of rest this night, may they make sure that all these conditions have been met and that they can sing, I am my Lord's and he is mine. Tis done, the great transaction's done. I am my Lord's and he is mine. Underscore and emphasize every word, knowing it's true. Grant this, we beseech thee, O Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.